Welcome to Groove Portia, the podcast that uncovers the hidden treasures within grief. I'm your host, Portia the producer, and I'm inviting you to join me on a transformative journey where we will exchange laughter, of course, the best medicine of them all. Reflect on cherished memories. Remember that time that the little boy grabbed my hand instead of his mother's at the amusement park? Yikes. And of course, discover gratitude while navigating one of life's hardest challenges, loss. So get ready to groove with me, Portia the producer. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Guru Portia. This episode is streaming live on my Facebook. So if you are tuning in, I am actually live. Do not disturb me because I will respond later on. So as always, I'm your host and executive producer, Portia the producer. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to keep up with the latest and greatest of all Guru with Portia. So today I have the honor to be joined by my brother from another mother, who is who I would call a semi-reinvented individual who is on a mission to equip others with safety tools for any life circumstance. So welcome back to Guru Portia, co-founder of Penton Pending Consulting Solutions, LLC, Mr. Larry Penton himself. Hey, Larry, how you doing today? We'll go, we'll call you LP as always. I'm doing great. You know how I was, you know how I do it. Any day that I wake up on this side of the dirt, I'm still <laughs> destined to do stuff. So let's go. What are we doing bring, it, bring it on like Donkey Kong. So right. as always, you know, I'm grateful to have you again be a guest on Grew of Portia, especially because you're the first guy that I've had on to really have a deeper dive into what grief looks like in our lives, right? So LP, for starters, for our audience who's tuning in, those who know you, they know that you are an entrepreneur just like me. Can you share LP with our audience and with me how you're navigating the grief that comes with being an entrepreneur, right? Let's be realistic. We change communities when we become an entrepreneur. We're no longer surrounded by that plethora of coworkers when we are in the corporate space or if we have to relocate for our entrepreneurial endeavor to flourish, we don't have that sense of community right off the bat. And then not all the time, we have the support even from the people in our network. So LP, can you share with our audience how you are navigating the grief that comes with entrepreneurship? It's a multifaceted team approach. Myself, my wife, Mrs. LP, as everybody calls her, the president of the company, the CFO, you know, she's the money. And, you know, we just work together just well. We have tons of conversations about everything from A to, A to Z. She helped me start. She's the co-founder of Pen Pen and Consulting Solutions, LLC. Uh, I still have a day job, a number of them. I still work. You know, a nine to five, I still do stop the bleed trainings across the country. Uh, so uh, we have a, a great network and great partners to help when, you know, there's not consistency in terms of residual income. That's a building process. Uh, we've been in business since two, uh, 2021, actually. And, uh, you know, these last two years have been phenomenal, more than I could have ever dreamed. Um, I remember going back to August 19th of 2019, I was featured in U.S. News and World Reports in this article called Diversity Emergency, and it's still online. So if you go to usnews.com or on that site, if you search either my name or the name of the article, Diversity Emergency, you will see this article that they featured me in. And we talked about some of the, the challenges uh, that is lacking in emergency medicine. I never thought, and I was active in the field at that time, I was doing fire and EMS. And I never thought that five years later, not only would I be retired from EMS and fire, but I'd actually have my own consulting firm and I'd be actually traveling the country teaching these things. You know, it, it, it's just a blessing and it keeps me from being down in those times where it's like, okay, I got to, let me search for some more clients. Let me schedule these classes and stuff because we're doing them more consistently now, but it's it's been a hard struggle and, and that can 
cause some depression that can cause some anxiety because it's like, man, am I making the right decision? Did I do the right thing in retiring? I know I retired because of my wife's health issues during the pandemic because I was a COVID medic. But when I think about grief, I think about the partnership that I have with Mrs. LP and there's always therapy available, you know, seek help. My father-in-law taught me a very valuable lesson. He says, seek help whenever you need it. You know, LP, I'm glad that you reinforced that seeking help, right? Because let's be realistic with you being in the healthcare field, there tends to be a running stigma that healthcare professionals are the ones that don't seek help when they're going through some type of trying time in their personal life or even in their work life. Because let's be realistic, right? As a first responder, you're there on the scene when anything can break out. And even let's be realistic, probably some of your traumas resurface during some of those moments when you have to be Superman for somebody else. NLP, I want to ask you something. I know during our last conversation, me and you kind of talked about where you had the experience of losing someone close to you within the last month or so. And I'm curious, LP, for you, how have you been navigating that grief journey of losing this close friend of yours? And how has it also maybe resurfaced some of the unresolved grief that you have been dealing with in your own life? Wow. I just got a text message from my friend. Her name was, was Tiffany Werner. And she's a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida in the Tampa Bay Clearwater area. She died July 16th of this year from a massive heart attack and some complications that came from that. Uh, I got a text message from her husband, her widow today. Uh, he was apologizing for not getting back in touch with me because I had sent him a message uh, last week. And, you know, I met this woman on this app called Clubhouse. I never met her in person, but I met her last July, or excuse me, last June. And we not only created a partnership as far as work-wise, because I've been on her show, which was called Moments of Clarity with Tiffany. Um, we developed a friendship just like you and I have, you know, and just like you and I would talk off air, offline about anything, everything, all things. She and I had the same rapport along with her husband. I, I know when I got the news and it's still hard, you know, I mean, we're just, we're all, everybody that knows her and loves her and, and we're, I'm, I'm part of that inner circle that she had. We're, we're just devastated. And, you know, it, it's not an easy conversation to have. She was a person that said her model was ending the stigma on mental health. And she always says change can only come when we stand together as one. I want to continue that. That's why I do the work that I do as even though I'm retired as a paramedic uh, and a firefighter. I deal a lot with mental health related issues in the work that I do. And I tell people that as far as first responders go, I just did a podcast uh, on my own podcast called Trigger One and Talk Podcast. We had a conversation about how first responders need help also dealing with post-trauma situations. Um, you know, we, we talked about crisis, critical incident stress debriefing and critical incident stress management. This is the process where once you go through a hard call, like maybe a, a kid died in a fire or something like that, or somebody got ejected from a car accident in a car wreck, trigger warning. Uh, the, I'm just flesh and blood at the end of the day. Forget the uniform and the badge and the certifications and the licenses and the training and the experience. At the end of the day, I'm just a person. I got feelings and emotions. Gender be damn, ethnicity be damn, all of that stuff. I got to go home to Mrs. LP and she, you know, if I'm on a 48 hour fire shift and she's like, hey, how was your day? And I'm like, you know, I don't give you the blood and guts, but, you know, it was a, it was a hard. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. 
you know, it was it's considered the murder capital of the U.S. and it's always in the top three for decades. So I experienced a lot of trauma on the job. You know what I always told Mrs. LP? I want to go to work healthy, happy, and whole, and I want to come back home the same way. And I would do everything in my power to do so. If I got to take a break, if I got to talk to somebody, including you or some professional, if I got to network with my coworkers and get a team effort in, involved in terms of dealing with the grief that we deal with, because we deal with grief all the time. I used to say I walked in blood every single day that I was on duty, literally. We all, as first responders, are not one cell amoebas. We're not cyborgs. We're not robots. We're living, breathing organisms. And we have to understand that probably about 40% of your 911 calls have a mental health component to them. 40%. That's a lot of mental health stuff that we don't get a lot of mental health training on. So that's part of how I deal with grief is seeking help and getting training and getting more resources collectively and talking to other first responders to make sure that they are keeping themselves in check and that they're doing everything that they can do to deal with these traumatic calls that they get because they can cause grief. You know, P, I love what you mentioned and, you know, sending my love to Tiffany's family. And of course, to you, me and Tiffany were Facebook friends and I never got a chance to talk to her in person. I kept telling myself to reach out to her, to reach out to her, but I never got a chance to. But I could tell. And when I look through her content, I'm like, oh, my God, we have so much in common. And LP, what I loved and especially about Tiffany's motto of ending the stigma around mental health. I'm curious, LP, what will that take to eliminate the stigma that we hold around grief, especially because grief has such a heavy negative connotation, especially when it's centered around somebody who makes their transition? We have to end the stigmas, the taboos, and the stereotypes when it comes to mental health. One of the things that I came up with is this quote, I say, Mental health crisis is the world's oldest continuous pandemic that's been around since the beginning of mankind. And folks, it ain't going nowhere. Until we deal with the stigmas, the taboos, the stereotypes, the guilt, the shame, the drama, the pain, the judgment, the grief, we are going to continue to see grief in various formats. Me being a first responder, even though I'm retired, I deal a lot as a consultant. I deal with active shooter hostile events or violent critical incidents. Of course, I get breaking news stories every day when these incidents happen. They're not all about guns because there can be anything like what happened at, at the uh, Montgomery, Alabama River uh, brawl. I did a Facebook post about that the day that it came out and I got the the information probably a few minutes after it was posted online. I talked about the lack of humanity that we saw in that unfortunate incident. Whether this what happened in Uvalde, whether this what happened in Sandy Hook, whether this what happened at the Travis Scott concert. We see these stories all the time and it desensitizes us to it because we say that's not going to happen here. It doesn't happen where I live. It doesn't happen in my community. It doesn't happen in my neighborhood. I have never experienced that personally. I say, well, every time you see these breaking news stories, if it does not affect you on some level, how is that possible? Because again, you're just a person at the end of the day. This is not a video game. We're not looking at something like a game like Call of Duty where you're just killing aimlessly and all that stuff or whatever. And then you get a couple of more lives or you can put in some codes and get infinite lives or something like that. We're talking about actual living, breathing human beings. There's 8 billion of us on this planet with a B. If you live to be a million years old, Portia, you will never get a chance to meet every living human being on the planet. When it comes to grief, one of the things that, that I talk about all the time is you got to deal with your adverse childhood experiences. You have to deal with your adult traumas. 
you have to deal with the desensitization. You have to deal as if, if you identify as a male, you have to deal with the emotional suppression that you were taught as a little kid. You know, I told you before, I had some older relatives that were males that would gut punch me and call me names and all that stuff that they saw me crying. They told me it was only five reasons that a, a guy should cry. He had to be falling off a, a, a multi-story building, crushed between a couple of cars. Somebody had to be dying, dead or dying. You had to have won or lost a major sporting event, or maybe you had a bad breakup, you know? And if, if you are someone who heard that growing up, and you heard that repeatedly and you got called sissy or you got called weak or, or different things like that. There was physical contact made because you were share, sharing your emotions or showing your emotions. That leaves a lasting impression on you. And when we're talking about grief, even in grieving situations, I've seen guys refuse to cry, refuse to show emotion, refuse to let themselves be human because they feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to appear to be weak. I can go on and on and on. Suffice it to say that it's all about making sure that you are doing what you need to do to live a full life. And part of life as we were trained is you got to say the words. I can't be like, hey, if I got a call that somebody went into cardiac arrest and, and I'm the lead medic and me and my squad show up and we're working on this patient, you know, 20, 40, 60 minutes and we can't resuscitate that person. I got to go to that family member, those loved ones, those caregivers and say, not, hey, your loved one just transcended to another dimension. No, I have to tell you. I am so sorry that we were not able to resuscitate your loved one. Your loved one has died. Here's what we believe happened. Here's what we do, what we've done. I will have everybody and their mama sitting right there while we're doing the resuscitative efforts. I have had family members, hey, you want to take two minutes to do some CPR? Because everybody needs a break. Two minutes, we rotate. You know, can you give me this? Can you help help us do that or whatever? Because I want you to be part of the process. So when I have to call time of death in a grieving moment, you know that we worked our butts off to do everything we could do to try to resuscitate this person. That's when the grieving process starts. You know, there's five stages of grief. You got denial, anger, bargaining, uh, depression, and acceptance. Sometimes you're going to fluctuate between those. We got to understand those five stages and what they really mean and how do you deal with those? Because at the end of the day, grief will come when it comes. It ain't no time clock. There is no calendar date of it. You know, you can prepare as much as you can. You can be as hard as you want to be. You can have boxes of tissue by you. But you never are prepared until it happens to you. That part, LP, and I love how you reiterated that grief is not linear, right? Let's be realistic that I think oftentimes we believe that we're all going to go through the same stages of grief because we saw someone else go through it depending on the circumstance, right? Whether it's we lose somebody suddenly or even let's just say we get terminated from a place of employment, right? That brings on grief because it was so sudden, especially when you've spent so much time in this space, whatever it might be, whether you're an IT person or an HR or even, you know, in the healthcare field, right? Like we all go through some type of level of grief. And I think the beauty though in grief LP is that there's always that hidden gift, right? There's always that hidden gift that can spring up through our grief journey. And LP, before we go on to the next part of the conversation, for our audience who's tuning in, if they're interested in connecting with you and learning more about you, is there a website or a social media handle you can share with us today? I can be contacted via my website, which is www.pensonpending, 
P-E-N-T-O-N-P-E-N-D-I-N-G.com. My IG handles are at LP Fire Medic, also at Penton underscore pending underscore CS as in consulting solutions. Excellent. So those of you who want to connect with LP, you definitely can. LP, I want to go back to something that you mentioned about men grieving, right? And I'm curious, being a man, yet alone a man of color, how can toxic masculinity be beneficial and also hinder somebody's grief journey and processing? I'll start with the him. So I love the the analogy that my friend Will Baptiste came up with some years ago. He talked about, he gave a few examples. I added one. He talked about Tyrese Gibson, Will Smith. I added Michael Jordan for context. Remember when Tyrese was on his IG Live and he was talking about the issues he was having with his custody issues with the mother of his child. And he was on on there and he was really emotional. What happened? They made a crying meme out of him. Same thing happened with Will Smith. Talking about pre-slap incident. When he was on the Red Table Talk, talking about the entanglement issue. What happened? They made a crying meme out of him. Michael Jeffrey Jordan. I'm in, I'm in Charlotte, so, you know. Michael Jordan. The night that he was being enshrined into the NBA Hall of Fame, the greatest night of his professional NBA career. What happened? They made a crying meme out of him. I said, now, if these famous Black men who are rich and wealthy can be made into crying memes, what do you think they're going to do with LP if I get on social media and I start talking about, you know, the loss of my friend Tiffany or, you know, the the estrangement that I have in my family dynamic or whatever. I don't want to be the butt of somebody's jokes. I don't want to be made into a crying meme. I don't want to be the laughing stock of whomever. We think about that as guys every single time, especially in this social media environment. Toxic masculinity, you know what I say about that? I say anything that's toxic is toxic. It don't matter if it's masculinity. It don't matter if it's a drug or a substance or whatever it is. Toxic is toxic. I mean, hey, do I need to put on a hazmat suit? Because I want to be, where is it? Where's the toxicity? I want to be 180 degrees away from where it is. So it don't matter to me what the source is. I just need to recognize it is what it is. As far as positivity, you take those, it's not your fault if you don't know. My mom taught me when I was a little boy a lot of things. And one of the things that she said as a single parent is, everybody's ignorant. We don't know everything. Intentional ignorance is something else. Because once you don't know something and you've, you've been made aware that you don't know it, it's not your fault if you don't know. But once you've been made aware of that, it's your fault if you don't find out. Retaining it, you know, that's part of the conversation also, but it can be a separate part. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King said, there's nothing more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I, I added the intentional to that sincere ignorance. I say sincere, intentional ignorance because we do some of these things all the time. We see them play out on social media and all of these things for males, especially black males, because there's such a hatred for the melanin that we possess. There's such a vilification of black men. I still go out places and still get prejudice I still get treated with systemic racism. And even when they find out that I'm a former first responder, sometimes that's not even good enough. So when we're talking about grief and toxicity in masculinity, I say you have to be maintaining situational awareness all the time, not just for safety physically, but your mental safety. 
because you can implode and do something to yourself. You can explode and do something to other people. And that, my friend, causes so much more pain and grief. You know, LP, what you're hinting on, especially being self-aware, right? Let's be realistic as a man, especially a Black man in a society that no matter what, whether you're doing something heroic or villainous, either way, the narrative is going to be twisted in some way, right? And one of the things that you're hinting on is anger, right? There tends to be a heavy negative connotation when it comes to anger. But I've learned that anger is love and passion combined. And LP, for our audience who's tuning in, whether they're a man who's currently, you know, whether a first responder, a professional like you, or a younger man, how can they use anger towards action to implement a positive change while they're going through grief? Anger is love and passion combined. I would say it can be controlled or uncontrolled. Love and passion combined. Let's deal with the uncontrolled part. This is where I get the 911 calls about, you know, somebody who lost their job, somebody who lost a loved one, somebody who lost a relationship, somebody who got their all white Air Force One scuffed accidentally, you know, somebody who did a road rage, road rage incident. Mrs. LP, she and I were in the car the other day and somebody cut in front of me real quick. And, you know, I, I slowed down a little bit and, you know, I just let them go ahead. And she looked at me and because I, I was driving and she said, she said this word called beets, like the vegetable, because we have safe words. And I told her if if I'm ever kidnapped and somebody calls you and says that, you know, they got me and they want whatever. And I said, you need to do one, a proof of life. Two, you need to ask a number of questions to make sure it's me, that they got me. And I said, when I was in EMS, I used to tell my partners, hey, if I say certain words, that lets you know that it's going down. Some, some bad is going to happen. So one of my safe words was the word beats because I don't like the vegetable or whatever. I say, if I say about, if I say anything with the word beats and I'm not talking about the headphones, you know, it's about to go down. Like we need to leave like yesterday. So she said beats and I was like, well, what are you talking about? And she was like, I can't believe that you didn't, that, that you didn't do a road rage thing or whatever. Normally you'd be cursing the person out and all this stuff. I say, you know what? I believe that with my, cause I'm 52 now. With my age comes wisdom. And because I see so such hatred in people losing their crap in, in driving situations so much that end up being these breaking news stories, I've chilled out with my road rage a whole lot. So, it, you know, that man must got stuff to do. Let him go ahead, you know. Hopefully... He doesn't go before me and gets involved in an accident that now I got to pull over and provide medical care for. Because every time we go out somewhere, I say a prayer. Lord, please let nothing happen where we're going that I got to lay hands on somebody, whether it's in a medical situation or in a protective situation. Amen. Now, that was, that's the uncontrolled. The controlled is part of what I just said. Also, you have to maintain control of that anger, even if it's about grief, because again, you got the five stages of grief, denial, anger is number two. You're going to be mad that this person is not around anymore. You're going to be mad that they got, their life got clipped. You know, you know, if they were 40 years old and they died or they were a baby and they died or they could be 90 years old and you're like, man, I'm not ready for them to go. You know, 
uh, if it was somebody that, that killed them, if they died in an accident, you know, whatever the situation is, you have to maintain the sense of control of that anger. And it's okay to feel anger because that's part of the human emotion and that's part of the human experience. In a grief situation, you have to sit there almost sometimes and do a woosah. You almost have to sit there and do some form of metaphysical modality, whether it's the EFT, the tapping, whether it's meditation, whether you actually get out and do some yoga. You may have to contact a metaphysician that specializes in Reiki or neuro-linguistic programming, NLP or cognitive behavior therapy for people that are dealing with grief and they might be having PTSD or CPTSD. You might have to do some EMDR. There's so many modalities that are available. Just laying on somebody's couch for 45 minutes doing a q and is not going to help pretty much anybody. So, and everybody does not need medicine. Medicine has its place. I'm just saying, there's so many things that you can do when, when anger manifests, especially from a grief situation, that you have options. And that's all we're talking about. Put the tools in your toolbox to deal with what's in front of you. Because if you don't, I'm going to get another breaking news story that I don't want. And you don't want that life. 100% LP. And, you know, you hit on so many of my favorite quotes of number one, there's so many tools available to us, right? In this intentional ignorance, right? You know, what is it? The book of 1984 says ignorance is bliss, right? But a lot of us, you know, I think there's a, there's a level of fear that comes when grief is present too, because there's this fear of, Yes, I know that there's other things available, but what does that look like, right? And so LP, you know, first and foremost, as always, I thank you for coming on and sharing your words of wisdom with our listeners. And I just love talking to you anyway, because coming from a medic standpoint and also dealing with your own level of grief and providing that personal heart to heart, because like I said, men don't often talk about what they're going through. And I think what you really hit on was being more encouraging to them. Any, yeah. any, whatever stage of life, any young man or someone who's your age that might be wrestling with grief of some sort and it's manifesting as anger, manifesting as depression, they have a way to, in a sense, convert that anger, convert those emotions of sadness, depression, fear into some actionable way to move forward with their life. LP again, for our audience who's tuning in, if they want to connect with you and learn more about you, please share your website and social media handle again. The website is www.pentonpending.com. The IG pages that we have, my personal page is at LP Fire Medic and the company's IG page is Penton at Penton underscore pending underscore CS for consulting solutions. Excellent. So everybody, that was our, who I will call our semi-reinvented CEO and founder of Penton Pending Consulting Solutions, LLC, Mr. Larry Penton himself that you heard from. And that concludes this live episode of Grew with Portia season number two. Thanks for listening. Peace and hair grease, everybody. Peace and hair grease. LP out. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to Grew with Portia. Remember to subscribe to my channel for the latest episodes. And of course, follow me on social media. You can follow me on Instagram at Portia, the producer. Anyway, guys, until we meet again, peace and hair grease.